Hi, everyone, and welcome again to the Musical Inner Tube. I am Don Rooney. And I am John Timpain. And John, our special guest today is Abby Mahone, who is the assistant head of school and head of early childhood and lower school at the Harrisburg Academy here in Harrisburg, where I live. And Abby, Dr. Mahone, welcome to the program. Well, thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Now, Abby, you deal with uh, with younger kids a lot, and um, this has been a very, very strange election cycle. The strangest, I think, yes. <laughs> Uh, how, how do you, it's hard enough for adults to comprehend what's going on and try to make sense of it all. How do you explain it to somebody who's kindergarten, first, second, third grade? Yeah, that's a great question. It has been such a weird time. Um, and I think, you know, as a leader in a school, there's a lot of responsibilities I have. Like I absolutely, part of my responsibility is to help guide the teachers and the students through navigating any difficult world event or, or, um, lesson, you know, that the students are exploring, but it's made particularly even more difficult because this election season, there has been such intense feelings on both sides. And so helping both the adults in the school remind them that, remember, your job is not to share your own political views, to try to encourage anyone to, to feel a particular way. Um, instead, it's about to present the facts and to help them navigate this this difficult scenario, what's happening in the world around us, and and to and to help them sort out their thoughts and feelings. And so we have to do that really delicately, um, because you know, they're, what they're hearing at home, <laughs> it's going to be very specific to their family's context, you know? And so, so oftentimes what we do, Don, is really take it down to levels that I think that the kids can understand. Yes, we're talking about politics and we're talking about, you know, around the world and, and this candidate and that candidate and do they do this and do they do that? But actually at the heart of it, it's really similar to a lot of the issues that kids face every day in school, on the playground, with their friends, um, you know, a lot of similar themes. How do you disagree respectfully? How do you, how do you take evidence and try to figure out what you believe in and what the best, you know, choice is to move forward? So kids can understand it on that micro level, um, and that's where we deal with them. And then, you know, we just kind of listen and nod when they talk about their their parents' particular political views. <laughs> you know, I should think that one of the um, challenges mm-hmm. is. You have kids who take everything in, right? They they Absolutely. see what they you know, they see what's going on on the streets. They see people talking over the garden hedge. They see yeah. uh, television. They hear the radio. Whatever exactly. it is, mm-hmm. and a lot of this, especially the last couple of weeks, has been uh, adults behaving badly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where where adults uh, are not acting with respect uh, on both sides of the other side, and and. Um, and being sneaky or, or being disrespectful or raising right. their voices or getting really calling names or right, calling, well, right. name calling, especially, which has mm-hmm. become a sort of an art. And uh, I wonder how one, <laughs> how, yeah, so that comes to school every morning. <laughs> it must yeah. be a challenge. It must be a real challenge. Well, absolutely. Well, I had the opportunity to speak to the entire school um, the day before the election, you know, and I'm, and I'm talking to these, these kids and, you know, and I said to them, listen, guys, you're right. We don't, you don't get a vote yet. You're not old enough. And and lots of them have lots of opinions. They think they should. They think they might do a better job than the adults on making decisions <laughs> right now. But, but I said, there are things that we can do now. Just because we don't have a vote, voting is one way that we that we make decisions about how we live and we work, right? But there's lots of other things that kids can do. And one of the first things I told them is, is being a role model, even being a role model for the adults in your life, you know, recognizing that this is a time highly emotional, highly charged, but that we still have a responsibility to interact with each other with respect and figure out how to disagree and recognize that if someone else has a different opinion from you, they're coming at it for reasons, right? It's not just because they're being a jerk, you know, they, they have reasons for believing what they do. And so there's an opportunity here for us to really learn about each other. And there's an opportunity for the kids to model that behavior for some of the adults in their life, you know, um, and that can be hard, that that can be, it's a hard thing to, you know, ask children to do. It's unfair in a way to ask them to do, but I think in schools, we can, we can 
try to set that different tone, you know, like we're not having the news on in the background at school. We're turning that off. I recommend families to do the same thing. Turn off the news, Mm. talk to your kids, talk together, set that tone. Um, that's different than what we're, what we're seeing modeling for us in the, in the news media and in debates and and all those types of things. When, uh, when kids are, are learning to read, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that stuff is, uh, stories about good guys and bad guys. Yeah. Binary. Good or bad? Exactly. And how do you, how do you reconcile that with uh, a political uh, candidate you like and a political candidate you don't like? Yeah. How how does that work out? Where you say to the guy or girl, um, the political candidate you don't like is still okay. They're still, I mean, they're not the bad guy. They're just a different shade. Do kids get that idea of of? being able to uh, accept somebody that has been taught to them to be the bad guy, maybe through their family or something else? Yeah, I think that's real hard. I think that's really hard, particularly like where kids are developmentally. You know, you think like little kids are obsessed with superheroes. And part of the reason is, is because it's like orderly, right? It allows them to see the world as good and bad and and that they can they can take up that shield and be good and fight the evil. Like there's a uh, kind of a simplicity and a beauty in that. But we all know that that's not how life is. Life is much more messy and complicated than that. And so is this a struggle? Absolutely. Is it something that we tackle every single day? Absolutely. Right. And, and I think how we do it in schools is is not talking about the nuances of what one candidate believes or not, particularly at the early childhood and lower school level. I think my answer would probably be different if you have a high schooler at home, a middle schooler and high schooler, and, and really asking them questions about, well, why would someone support that decision, right? Because there's very reasonable people on both sides of the aisle who think completely differently about a topic, but they have reasons for doing that. And reasons for thinking that, you know, and so pointing out that perspective, I think, is really important. What uh, what glasses, you know, people are looking through. But for the youngest learners, I, I have to tell you, I think that it's much more successful when you bring it down to like something very simple. Um, and, and usually it's interactions that that they're having with the student with with each other. And so something something that just happened this week in school. (laughs) Um, Two students were in gym class and one student went to run after a ball and pick it up. And the other student went to kick the ball and accidentally kicked the other kid in the head. Ah, like (laughs) not great situation, right? Particularly not great when you call mom and you're like, well, I have to tell you that your child kicked another child in the head today. Um, (laughs) So the child that was kicked in the head felt like horribly wronged, rightfully so. She had just gotten a foot in the forehead, you know, but when we sat down and talked it out and both sides got to say what happened from their perspective, they realized that the one kid who kicked her in the head wasn't evil. He wasn't trying to get her out to get her. It had been an accident. He was going after the ball, right? But to to take the time to slow down and talk that out and recognize that each child's perspective, they were seeing something different in that scenario, which led them to to have their kind of view or narrative of the entirety of it allowed them to see the situation more fully. So whether it's a disagreement on the playground or or something big like the election, I actually think it's our responsibility as adults to help kids slow down and really see those different perspectives. What it's about a- kids? Uh, oh, go ahead, John. No, that's fine. You're good. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. See how we do this? Very See good. I'm very impressed happen? with your tur- your turn taking skills. Aww. Thank you. Thank Nicely you very done. much. <laughs> um, kids kids can get scared too. They and and they can get scared in an intuitive way where mm-hmm. they know something's off or wrong, uh, and they may not even know exactly why. But yeah. they're getting a vibe maybe at home or at school that something's wrong, and it it unsettles them. Well, I think you know I'm glad that you brought this up um, because. I, I want to actually complicate it a little bit more. So I, I, I wish that I could say, oh, yeah, yeah, kids are able to really articulate their thoughts and feelings and fears, and then we're able to have a coherent conversation about it, right? Wouldn't that be beautiful if that's the way it worked? Um, but honestly, more often than not, what I see is just kid fear in young children comes out in a myriad of ways. They could be 
you know, they could be more disengaged from class or they could be acting out in class and more argumentative or more physical. They might struggle with regulating their emotions, you know, and and so you at home might be like, why is my child like being taken over by a monster? I don't understand what's going on when really they're having big feelings and they don't quite know why, right? Like uh, particularly youngest learners, you know, if your child's in preschool, you know, four, five, six, they're going to feel the tension in the world if you have the news on or if you're debating politics in front of them or disagreeing. They're going to feel that tension, but they're not going to quite know what it's about um, or how to deal with it. And so I think that's why it's so very important for parents to really take the narrative of what's going on in the world out of the hands of the news media, actually out of the hands of the politicians, and instead control that in their own own homes. Like, turn off the news, watch your own tendency to have big emotional reactions. Of course, adults are human, we're going to have those, but just be mindful of them when kids are around it and explain why it's happening you know, make, share your opinions. Absolutely. We should be sharing our opinions, but back them up by facts. Um, and, and talk to, talk to your children in a way that's age appropriate. I mean, there's, there's a way that you can talk to a child in, in preschool and not give them all the level of detail and nuance as you would as a, as a middle or upper school child. And, and I think sometimes, when your child is having big feelings, you also have to be really patient with them because they might not have the capacity to talk it out with you in the way that you would like him to. You might just have to like lean in and spend more time with them doing the thing they want to do. You know, maybe it's playing Lego or maybe it's playing school. And and all of a sudden, when they have your attention doing something different than talking about the election or talking about big feelings, you'll see them just start to say, you know, mom, what what's going on with the election right now? Or, or, you know, are you and daddy? Okay. Why are you arguing? Like oftentimes it'll come out in not on your adult timeline, (laughs) but on the kids timeline when they're feeling safe and connected with you. So, um, I imagine this doesn't happen only during, uh, election years, even though I think during an election year, there's a lot you can use to, I mean, there's so many teachable moments. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and I'm just wondering uh, during non-election times, uh, what are the what are the issues that keep creeping into class that you guys find you have to field? You know, civic issues or or issues you know of adult behavior that often you find you have to you know coach kids on. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that my first response to that is honestly around a lot of the issues that have become such hot button topics during this election, right? Um, It it is, it's so charged right in this moment, but, um, you know, issues of inclusion and diversity and equity, you know, like, even if we're not talking about it, that doesn't mean that students aren't feeling it and having to grapple with it, you know? And so that's something that as a, as educators, I think that we can do a better job about, um, you know, that's one of the first ones that come to mind. But I think anything that really makes kids feel other, you know, I I think that, that we need to do a better job of, of making kids feel safe and seen and, and that they can, that they can talk about their own lived experiences and, and feel like they're able to speak up to, to talk about what doesn't feel right and what isn't good, you know? Um, so, so that those types of topics, I think are salient all the time, like these issues of disagreement that we're talking about right now, it's about the election. We're seeing, you know, how polarized the country is, but, but I think, you know, in schools, it can be over something like something big, but also over something small, like which class pet you want to get, you know, like, like <laughs> it's amazing how, how we, we, we want to divide ourselves, you know, like I'll play with you in the playground, but I'm not playing with you. Like it's so much of this otherness, this, desire to try to group and who's with me and who's not with me. And I think as a country, you know, we, we have to grapple with that and schools need to grapple with that in, in both big and, and small ways. I should think that one of the hardest things to learn for small kids, because your family is everything, it's everything yeah. that you know about the world. And you sort of make this assumption deep down inside yourself that, okay, everybody's house is like this. Yeah. 
And one of the biggest uh, sort of eye openers is to realize, no, uh, culture is different from house to house. Every People do not have the same experiences. Right. Um, culture exists. It's a thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. And by the very same token that we have a diversity of of kinds of people, we also have diversity of experiences and upbringings and, Mm -hmm. you know, the people, uh, well, just a very basic thing. People have different religions, right? And they, 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 uh, celebrate different holidays and they have different sort of calendar family, uh, outings. Uh, and if somebody's Islamic, it will be difficult to explain to people why, um, uh, Ramadan is joyful, even though you don't get to eat. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> you, you know, just little things like that. I'm, I'm sure that creeps in a lot to, uh, you know, to the the teacher's experience. Yeah, I think so too. I had a uh, one of my um, professors when I was working on my doctorate would would talk about school culture, and so not not individual identity, but like school culture and how to change school culture, and and implicit in even the definition of what culture is is that if you're in it, you can't see it, right? Well, like, it's invisible. It's in, exactly. one of the things about culture is you can't see it. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that that is at the heart of what makes it so challenging for students to talk about this because, because they're, they're small children. They haven't, sure, they've seen their context, right? But it's been shown to them through their own family's, family's perspective and culture. And so they're not able to yet pick out those things. And so they probably assume everyone is just like me. And so there's a lot of opportunity in that, you know, but I also, uh, to see, to see similarities and to brace each other and to make friends fast on the playground. Wouldn't I wish I could make friends as fast as my five-year-old can when she goes to the playground. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, but, but I also think as educators, then it's, it's our job to point, point to differences, not as a bad thing, but as a joyful thing, right? Like, Aren't we lucky that we get to live with people who have different ideas and opinions and experiences and that we get to learn from them, right? You know, and if that's the emphasis in schools, then it's not about us and them. All of us are us and all of us are different, you know? I I did want to ask about whether uh, you got any questions about the demonstrations that happened in the spring. Uh, the Black Lives Matter and uh, uh, related uh, demonstrations, whether uh, you heard kids ask you about that. And this is under that rubric again of inclusion. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Um, so we, we did, I would say that, um, that, that most explicitly in the middle and upper schools and with our alumni reached out to us and we're very grateful to have them reach out to us um, and express their experiences while they were at the academy and allow us the opportunity to be better and to do better. Um, you know, and so it's it's very challenging because as an organization, we need to to uh, here I am talking about like how important it is to make everyone feel welcome and seen and loved, right? And and we're also in a time where so many things are so politicized that phrases, you know, that if you even say that we value diversity and we want to become more diverse, people can see that as a political statement when it's not meant to be, right? You know, um, and so we are working really hard to find appropriate ways to become better in in all different aspects of the school. So, you know, like academic programming is going to look different for our upper school students than it is for our lower school students. But we can still talk about identity and belonging and who we are and how we're different and can learn from each other when you're a kindergartner, just like you can when you're an upper school student. You know, the the level of conversation, the detail will be different, but you can still get at, at the heart of, of those issues. You know, and, and quite frankly, here we are talking about students, but, you know, as an organization, we also have to look at what our admission policies look like and how we're communicating to families. And, you know, we have to look at it holistically. We should mention also uh, that the... Uh, Harrisburg Academy has students from kindergarten all the way up to high school. Um, so it's it's a very, very uh, diverse. It's not uh, an elementary school, a middle school, a Correct. high school. It's all, uh, it's all schools in one. Yeah. And kids can go there from kindergarten all the way through the end of their schooling before they go off to college. So uh, you get, you get a kid for a good long period of time and, uh, 
Don, you're doing my job better than me. You're hired. <laughs> well, thank you. I am looking for outside opportunities at this point. It's got to be. It's got to be very. It still has to be a challenge, doesn't it? I mean, it still has. There's still a lot of delicacy that has mm-hmm. to be involved. Uh, it's very easy to be do the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think that that can keep us from trying. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I, I, I was reading a book. Um, and it was actually a, a children's book about about racism. Um, and it was saying one of the most powerful, um, it was by Dr. Kendi, and one of the most powerful tools we have to dismantle racism and to help each other feel included is to like, just talk about when we make mistakes. <laughs> you know, like we're gonna, like life is messy, whether we're talking about race or we're talking about, you know, um, any number of things and people are going to make mistakes. There's no right way to do that, but we can't let the fear of messing up, keep us from talking about it. We just might have to apologize when we get things wrong and try better next time, which ultimately, right. Isn't that when we think about what school is really about, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about what I went, you know, learned in school, I actually can't really remember all of the content. My brain just doesn't work that way. I know there's lots of people who have like perfect memories. I don't remember a lot of the content, but I am a product of learning how to like fail and try again and fail again and try again and apologize. (laughs) You know, like that I think is actually one of the most important things we can teach kids to do. Yes. Training them how uh, to recognize when they've made an error and, and graciously, uh, sort of manage that is, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing skill that most of us never learn. Right. Think, you know? Um, right. Absolutely. I, I mean, I talk to teachers all the time. They're like, Oh, Abby, I couldn't get to my math lesson because, you know, we had to have a conversation about playground behavior. And so all parents out there, math is very important. I'm a complete proponent for teaching all the math lessons. However, that's not wasted time. It's not wasted time to figure out how to, you know, navigate through a disagreement on the playground. If we take the time to do that now about how to have like respectful dialogue now on how to have, you know, debates now, evidence-based and kind and respectful, all those things, won't that actually really potentially help you know, this generation when they grow up and they have a contentious election, because it's going to happen again. History has shown us that. It's those lessons that maybe will give us, you know, the next time we have a real divided country, give us a, a chance to maybe do it better. Yes, we're doomed to repeat ourselves. Yeah. In, in the old <laughs> saying. Uh, let's talk about, uh, again, the, the dynamic between home and school. Um, so somebody goes to the school uh, like the academy or any school that tries to instill uh, tolerance and acceptance and mm-hmm. behavior, say they go home, say dad or mom is not as tolerant of mm-hmm. everybody in the world. Uh, is it, Does that create a discord in the kid? And, and how is that handled? Yes, you are asking the hard questions, Don. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, well, you know, it's all part of my routine here. Of excellent, excellent. Asking the tough questions. It's a hard-hitting journalism. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. We, as an educator, and I can say this in a general sense, um, but it's true at Harrisburg Academy, like, we work best when we're able to partner with families. Absolutely. And and I find time and time again, even if there are disagreements, there is common ground that we can agree on. You know, we want what's best for kids. We want kids to be kind and empathetic. And we want them to be challenged, all those things. With that said, are there absolutely times where kids come in and say, well, at home, my mom said, or I don't have to do this because, yes, right? And so, you know, the fact of the matter is, is I can give recommendations and I can talk to families and provide guidance, but ultimately, you know, families, your job is to, to raise your kids as best as you see fit, you know? And so there, there are, there are uncomfortable or hard moments in schools where we might disagree, but that doesn't mean the work at school changes, you know, the, even if, if you come in and and you have some strong opinions or, or your family is sharing strong opinions in the building, there still isn't, we have very clear expectations about how we relate to each other and, and how we speak to each other and, you know, and, um, and there are some things, honestly, right, that that I've had to really have some hard thoughts about myself in it, to say, well, what things am I willing to 
let slide and what things will I absolutely never let slide, even if it upsets some families, you know, and, and um, thankfully I'm in a community where that doesn't, that doesn't come up very often, you know, um, where, where we, we have a generally all agreed upon that we value respectful dialogue and evidence-based debates and, and all of those things. We're really lucky to have that, but, but, um, but it, it's, it doesn't mean it's not messy sometimes and it's not hard. I mean, um, I was thinking as you were talking that um, in the last uh, couple of generations, at least the relationship of parents to teachers uh, has really changed. I mean, there was a time probably when I was a kid, actually, when uh, if you came home with a bad grade, uh, you you might get whomped because your, your, your teachers and uh, your parents were on the same side pretty much. And if you didn't do well in school, it had to be your fault, <laughs> you know, but I think that many parents, I mean, and this is a big generalization, so forgive me, but they've gone, they've gone from that kind of, you know, always backing up the teacher to being advocates for their children, which is not, you know, which is often, you know, uh, can increase the tension, let's just say. And I'm wondering if that's been your experience. Oh, again, I think you might be trying to get me in trouble. No, <laughs> I'm I, I, I'm not asking for names. But. <laughs> no, 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 I'm teasing. No, I... I think, I mean, I've heard, you know, teachers and and parents talk about that too. I mean, there's definitely our shifts in education and an expectation, you know, but I have to say that even in the hardest parent interactions that I've had as an administrator, there's always common ground, you know, that we share the, the need to, to, to care for and challenge students, right? That that if we start from that place, there might be disagreements about how to go about that, you know, uh, achieving that goal. But that if you always come back to that same common ground, usually you can really make wonderful progress and partner with families together. You know, in my in my experience, uh, if if something has really gone awry, it's because I haven't done a good enough job communicating with families um, and meeting them where they are. It's not because, you know, parents are, are enabling the kids to get away with whatever they want to, you know. Um, I think that that if you're willing to do the work and to truly listen to each other and where each other are coming from, while there might be some disagreements here and there, you all you all can hold the children the child at the the center of the decision making and know that you're all there for them um, you can always find your way through it and and oftentimes I got to tell you that when there is conflict or different of opinions usually when we sit down and listen to each other we, we all come up with a better option than we walked into the room with right because we're we're bouncing ideas off of each other and learning from each other you know because parents are Yes, I'm a, you know, I'm a doctorate of education. Yes, that is true. Um, but parents are also the experts on their kids, you know, and so we really need to listen to their experiences and what they're seeing at home. And, and when we do that, they, they're, they're also listening to what we're seeing at school and recognize that school environment and home environment are very different. And we're, we all have the honor of getting to see a slightly different side of, of the child. And, and our job is to work together to see how we best can support them. We're not trying to get you in trouble. It's just, if I'm Mike Wallace, uh, John is, is Jerry Springer. So, <laughs> no, it's that's fine. Uh, kind of how, how we're playing. Um, it, it, for uh, purposes of, of both teachers and parents, what are your recommendations when we come into these troubled times? We have uh, some very, very hard political views on both sides. We have things like Black Lives Matter, where racism is coming up to the forefront. Um, what pointers can you give parents and teachers on how to tackle these problems when, when the kids become involved? Yeah, really important. Um, one of our most important jobs right now, right? Um, I think a few things that I would say. One, and, and I might reiterate some themes I've talked about already. I think that uh, turning off the news and having real conversations with your child is important. I think you need to watch watch how you emotionally respond, um, have that kind of under control before you're talking to your child. Share your opinions, but always back them up with facts. I mean, that's that's an important skill for, for kids to learn. Work really hard not to vilify the other side, you know, and... I think that so often we don't give our kids enough credit. Like I think kids can absolutely 
handle more than we give them credit for. I think they can have hard conversations if you talk to them and are straight with them. I also think that they can make change, more change and take action in more ways than we give them credit for. So kids can't vote right now. That's true. They couldn't go out in the election, but that doesn't mean that there's not ways that they can improve and help the community. Kids can take action, you know? And so as you're having these conversations with your family and you're talking about your opinions and what you wish was different, Think about ways that your family and your children can be involved in the change making process. Maybe it's, you know, a part of a food bank and volunteering there. Maybe it's in a religious organization or with your school, or maybe it's, you know, with the election, writing postcards, nonpartisan to get to make sure you're voting, right? Your your kids can be involved in all of these different ways that makes our community better. So I recommend for families to really talk to each other, really listen to each other and find the things that your family is passionate about and find ways to help change that for the better. All right. Very good advice. Hey, <laughs> uh, hey Abby, thanks for being with us today. We didn't mean to get you in trouble if we no, did. Um, hopefully not. I think I stand behind everything I said. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> and uh, thanks again for all of the advice and all of the help. Very useful. Yeah. It's really been very, very enlightening. Thanks very much, Abby, for being here today. Oh, thanks so much, guys. And thank you for listening to the Musical Inner Tube. If you'd like to get in touch with us, our email address, musicalinnertube, all one word, at gmail.com. On Twitter, John is at jtimpain, and Don is at donrooney9. Our webpage is musicalinnertube, that's musical spelled with two A's, dot libsyn, spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N, dot com. The Inner Tube available on Amazon Music. If you're a member of Amazon Prime or subscribe to Amazon Music, just type Musical Inner Tube in the search box and you'll find us. We're also on Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio Podcasts. Like us and give us a good review on any of those platforms. And as always, thanks to the virtual band Car Radio Dog for providing our theme music. 